during Zoom. Um, I want to welcome you to this, um, this session. Um, I have to tell you, we got double the registrations from the last years um, that we've had it. Um, I have a feeling people are going to trickle in a little bit later because I don't think people are used to actually coming physically to work at 8 o'clock in the morning anymore. Um, so um, the last time we were in person was June of 2019. Okay, so I know a few months later, the world changed. And, you know, so it's just like so good to see faces again. I think, you know, it feels like the world's coming back, back to us. So that's really fantastic. We have not stopped our mission um, supporting clinical research um, over the last three years. I think we've done tremendous things and I'm really proud of, of the work that everybody has done. Um, and so what I want to do right now is kick this off and hand it over to Zach Kohani. I don't think um, Zach needs introductions and he doesn't like me to introduce him, so. Okay, so. But could you help me? Um, you are, you are, it, your first slide is right here. And moving the slides will be like this. Probably not. This one maybe? Oops, no, that won't do it. Mark, do you know how to advance the slides? All right. I brought back up, so. Is it open? I don't know if it's open. Oh, it is. Yeah. Just poke it. Poke it forward. Maybe we can minimize this. There's the mouse. And then do put it into presenter mode. Yeah. Just move this slide. Can you just go to this one? Can you do the. Uh, we have to. One minute, everyone. <laughs> we, forgot, we forgot how to use PowerPoint. <laughs> Start. Why don't you start? All right. Well, uh, welcome everybody uh, to um, our annual meeting. Uh, my name is Zach Kohane. A few of you uh, don't know who I am, so I'll just briefly uh, summarize. I'm uh, the department chair of, of the uh, Department of Biomedical Informatics here at uh, Harvard Medical School. School. Well, we're right now at next to Harvard Medical School. Harvard Medical School, I believe, is that way. Um, and um, I've been working with colleagues here on I2B2 since approximately, I think, 2005. And um, what I would first like to do, if possible, oh, it's really not moving forward, um, is first of all, thank uh, our sponsors uh, because uh, without them, we would not have uh, been able to uh, have this meeting. And first, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dell Technologies, who have not only uh, sponsored this uh, conference, but actually funded several of the uh, initiatives that you'll hear about today. Are we good? Wait, 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 don't go away. There we go. Yay, thank you. Um, so yes, Dell Technologies, as well as Harvard Catalyst. Harvard Catalyst is the uh, translational center for uh, uh, biomedical research at Harvard Medical School, ITTM, and uh, Trinetics, which is a company that actually uh, spun off technology, spun, uh, which is a company that spun off technology 
from uh, Shrine, which I'll be describing to you shortly. So thank you very much to our event sponsors, and when you're drinking coffee, think of them and thank them, uh, in your mind at least. So I'm going to have some very brief comments this morning and talk about a 21st century under, um, approach to understanding whole patients. And what do I mean by that? What we've learned from precision medicine is that any given single modality, genetics or clinical, is insufficient to understand what's going on with a patient, to really understand what's going on with the patient, both for research and for clinical care, you have to understand both the um, genomics, the clinical, the environmental exposures, the doctor's actions. And so as we approached over the last 20 years, the um, challenge of getting the right data from patients we understood that it was going to be a fork in the road. And here I've taken a photograph that I took of the um, fork that is in Lake uh, Geneva in Switzerland. It's a fork uh, right outside the uh, Museum of Food of Nestle in Veve. Um, and so it makes a nice uh, visual metaphor for the fork that we took. And what was the fork? The fork was that there was going to be two sources of data, and the first, on the symbolized by that institution-like building at the, on the right, is hospital data extracted from the electronic health record. This is a data source that has grown with the broadening of the implementation of electronic health records across multiple institutions going from in the year uh, 2008 from about 10, 15 percent of U.S. hospitals to about 90 percent now. On the other side, on the left, is data coming from patients. Now data coming from patients has been slower to uh, come to uh, fruition, and yet may end up being perhaps the most important part. It started with the kind of uh, recreational data that you can get from things like the Fitbit, which tell you uh, about uh, your exercise and your heart rate, but as we'll get to, the patient themselves may be the most significant uh, source of institutional uh, data. So if you'll forgive me, I'm going to do a little bit, I'm going to do a little bit of uh, a uh, look back at my own uh, research trajectory to explain how we approach this fork in the road. This is a, pro a project, the W3EMRS project that we proposed in 1994 and actually was completed and published in 1996, where we had, if you recall, the web had just come into being around 1994. And what we did is we proposed that over the web we would share HL7 messages to multiple hospitals. In this case, the hospitals were MGH, Beth Israel, and Children's Hospital. And in real time, obtain the data from patients in each of those three hospitals. And we had this working in real time so that the thing that we all wanted, which is to be able to see the patient's history across multiple hospitals, was actually happening. And as you'll see, that vision has actually, although it was technically realized, has not come to be fully implemented for years, except on the research level, as we'll get to in Shrine. At the same time, uh, my former thesis, my, my thesis advisor, Peter Solvich, in 1994, 
had proposed something called the Guardian Angel Project, which is a project where patient data was overseen by um, agents overlooking uh, their data. And I had taken a small slice of that project and created something called the Personal Internetwork Notary and Guardian, PING. And what PING was about was having encrypted XML of your entire record on generic web pages. So you could store on uh, a, a web page encrypted your, your entire record. And there were multiple uh, levels of encryption and you'd tra traverse that encrypted tree to find out uh, details of the patient. And this was fed, this was fed by data from the institutions that you were associated with. So this was a purely patient-oriented perspective. Now it turns out that when we developed this, Microsoft and Google actually uh, heard about it, and in fact we had a conference describing it, and they had adopted, much to their chagrin, this technology. So for example, um, Microsoft had something called Health Vault, which actually used some of this technology in them. And unfortunately, the market was not anywhere near ready to have this kind of technology. And so, although they invested a lot of money in it, it ended up not being particularly successful. Google did not use uh, our code base, but they uh, implemented something similar for Google Health, and that too did not go well because the world was not yet ready to share data uh, for patients. So these are the two sides of the uh, fork in the road that I showed you before, the patient side and the institutional side. And it keeps on going, so let's, let's see where it goes. Shown here is something that I hope you're all very familiar with, with is the I2B2 project. Now, this was a project that was funded by the National uh, Institutes of Health as part of their Nas National Centers for Biomedical Computing. What you may not know or never knew or forgot is that we had two very large specific aims. One was we wanted to do genomics at scale so that we would be able to use patient populations to run the studies that were previously millions of dollars and tens of years in the making. And we showed how we could use discarded specimens and the phenotyping from the electronic medical record to actually be able to characterize thousands of patients and gather their, their samples so we could run genome-wide association studies for literally 1% of the cost and easily 1 20th of the time of uh, standard uh, cohorts. Another big uh, uh, push that we had in um, the proposal that we sent to NIH was that we were going to look not only at the codified data, but at the natural language as a textual data. And there was a big effort that we uh, led in transforming text into codified data so that we could actually systematize these kinds of um, analyses. And that led to several large studies which I will not summarize, but you're free to look them up. So this then led to a number of studies where we made the point, but we didn't make the point in a, in a in a theological or doctrinaire way, we made the point because it was the only way we were going to succeed that we could, that a distributed query, a query across systems that were not willing to commingle their data was actually more powerful than waiting for them to eventually bring their data together. Instead, sending out a query to each of these systems where the data remained in their local database, but the local database would share limited amounts of information to allow real-time meta-analyses. This was actually a outgrowth from the W3 EMRS project that I told you about before. And this led to what was on the left, something called the SPIN project, the Shared Pathology Informatics Network. This was a distributed query across multiple 
uh, pathology databases across the United States funded by the National Cancer Institute to allow us to find samples across the United States. That same technology set us up for something that you'll be hearing a lot more about today, and since it's important, I'm going to say it many times in my few minutes here, which was the, sh uh, the uh, Shrine uh, technology, the Shrine Network, Shared Health Research Information Network. And it was essentially the same technology as for SPIN applied for EHR databases. And we implemented it across Harvard hospitals, where I can tell you the politics of sharing across Harvard hospitals was frighteningly difficult. As I'd like to say, Zach's axiom is the closer in space two hospitals, the more they hate each other. Um, and so we were successful in doing that, and that led to a number of shrine implementations, um, including at Harvard, across uh, the United States for various research purposes. It resulted in across the clinical translational science um, centers in the United States, something called the ACT Network. And I'm very pleased to announce that uh, NIH has just funded the ENACT uh, Network, which is the next generation of this uh, Shrine Network. And one of our sponsors, I should point out, um, Trinetics, has actually, um, their technology is an outgrowth from the uh, Shrine Network technology. And again, since I'm so excited about it, I'm going to repeat many times. Now the Shrine code base is part of the I2B2 Transmart Foundation uh, software packages with the right licensing and will be supported from here on end authoritatively by the foundation. So that's, I think, a pretty, uh, uh, how would I say it, a pretty um, productive uh, continual thread going from W3EMRS to ENACT. But I would be uh, remiss if I did not point out continued success on the other side of the fork, namely patient-driven records. So back in 2009 with my colleague Ken Mandel, we uh, recognized that there was uh, an amazing um, development happening with the iPhone, which at the time was new, and which was that you could have apps generated for a feature, like a camera, using the camera um, electronics and um, optics of the iPhone. But if you didn't like one camera app, you could download another camera app. And it was absolutely non-technical to do the replacement. It was completely modular. And we realized that you could not do that for an electronic health record. If you did not like the order entry system, you couldn't just uh, replace the order entry system. You'd have to replace the whole EHR, which meant you'd have to fire the CEO of the hospital who had just spent a billion dollars on that uh, system. And so we said, why couldn't healthcare be more like that? So we defined basically an, uh, an API called Smart on Fire. And uh, through a long uh, story, which I don't have time to tell you here, through a long story that I don't have time to tell you here, uh, Smart on Fire was implemented by six out of the top seven electronic health record vendors, including Epic and Cerner. And there's a long story to be told about that, but the patient side of the story is completely unexpected, and I certainly didn't predict it, but as I always like to say, better be lucky than smart. So there was someone by the name of Ricky Bloomfeld who implemented the Smart on Fire stack on top of Epic at Duke University. And then he was hired by Apple. And he left Duke, and he implemented the Smart and Fire stack in the Apple Health uh, ecosystem. And not only that, he arranged for multiple negotiations, hospital after hospital, so that, for example, if you're a patient in, uh, with MGB in Boston, you can see on your iPhone in Apple Health, your labs, your 
procedures, we have diagnoses, the um, demographics, in addition to all the other uh, things that the Fitbit gets. But you get from the hospital your, your medications, all in a standardized terminology. And they now have reached over 800 hospitals in the United States. That's 40 million Americans. And they're well on their way to about 2,000 in two years. So they'll have most of America um, patient-enabled to access the data and to share their data. There's lots that this is going to um, enable. And is Rahil going to be speaking with us today? And you'll hear uh, from um, one of our um, researchers how this data repository is being used in a way that, uh, well, I don't want to steal the thunder, that will be exciting and change perhaps uh, how we support uh, patient decisions. So I'll stop there with regard to the narrative, but just say we're now in this great, brave new world in the 21st century where we've really opened up electronic health record systems and we've really opened up the ability of patients to control the flow of that information. And um, I'm very excited that the I2B2 Transmark Foundation is at the center of this. So quickly, let's talk about the highlights. There's been a new software release for I2B2 and Transmart. We've been very, very busy supporting uh, COVID research internationally across eight countries, 230 hospitals as 4CE. Nationally, just looking at uh, the post-COVID efforts, recover. You'll hear about the very exciting uh, work, also supported by Dell, I should say, of the Global South Initiative, where we're really reaching out to colleagues across the world, and particularly in India, who previously have not been part of this community. You'll be hearing um, about some really interesting technologies, about a fire server on top of InterSystems, which is a intermediate on its, uh, on its way to the I2B2 system supported by InterSystem. You'll hear there's been a serviceless uh, deployment of I2B2 in the AWS cloud. You'll hear from our colleagues in France about this amazing thing where boneheaded doctors like me can use an ultrasound and become all this, all, all this cardiac ultrasound and all of a sudden become expert ultrasonographers by virtue of the use of artificial intelligence to uh, guide us. You'll hear, uh, as I told you about, uh, a patient perspective from the access data from Rahil, Sa Rahil Saeed. I told you about that already. And you'll hear from the Saeed Tabet at Dell and from Sean Murphy about I2B2 support for a digital twin. You'll hear, also hear from uh, updates from the European community. I just got a little bit, before, when I was drinking coffee, a little bit of a um, uh, advanced uh, taste from uh, Ulrich Sachs and Jonas, and I think it's going to be very exciting. You'll also be hearing what's coming up next uh, with NCATS. I'm sorry for stealing uh, the thunder and telling you about the, uh, the, uh, the follower on of our um, ACT network and ACT. You'll hear about the very exciting and beautiful, mwah, no longer uh, 1990s uh, user interface uh, to um, I2B2. You'll be hearing from Bill Simons about the Shrine 4.0 release. And there'll be an open discussion around uh, the uh, I2B2 uh, roadmap. In the day two, you're gonna, that's when we roll up our sleeves, and you'll hear uh, this will be much more hands-on. Uh, you'll hear about uh, updates about ontologies, about ETL, about user interface. You'll learn more about Enact, and there'll be technology work workshops. And I've said this already, but I am excited about it. I really want to welcome Shrine, this distributed uh, uh, query uh, system and software stack uh, to the foundation. And it's going to be uh, used in a variety of uh, projects that I'm very excited uh, to uh, witness. And with that, I want to thank you all and welcome you to a really exciting uh, program. Thank you, Diane. Thank you.